Hello and welcome. We're very excited today to present to you Navigating LGBTQ plus issues in the workplace. We're presenting from Stanley Black and Decker. My name is Nicole Fulton. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm a manager in our talent development department. Presenting with me today is also Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Pelletier. My pronouns are he, his, and him. And I'm the director of advanced manufacturing for Stanley Black and Decker. Elise. Hi, I'm Elise Gauthier. My preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a plant manager for Stanley Black & Decker. Mimi? Hi, everyone. My name is Mimi Gonzalez. I, am, I work in human resources at Stanley Black & Decker, and my preferred pronouns are she, her, and hers. And Sophie. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophie Johnston. I work at Stanley Black & Decker, obviously. I work in the trade compliance department. I'm an import specialist and my pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. And so today, let's take a look at some of the topics we'll be covering. We'll be looking at how to become educated um, in your job applications, um, using pronouns in the workplace, dealing with microaggressions in the workplace, what does it mean to be an ally, finding an ally at work, dealing with a lack of understanding in the workplace, We'll hear some personal stories from uh, the folks on the panel today. And then lastly, we'll share some resources for you. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Hi everyone. Most of you are, are in high school or just graduating or in college and, and graduating college and you'll be looking for your first part-time or full-time job. So with that, you'd wanna find a, a company that's open to diversity and inclusion and respects the LGBTQ plus community. So one of the first things that I recommend doing is going out to the website of each company and find out if they have a diversity inclusion tab. This will give you an indication if, uh, if the companies have policies uh, respecting the LGBTQ community plus other communities that are out there. And you know, once you um, secure a job interview, ask the representative about the diversity inclusion policies if you feel comfortable doing so they'll be able to uh, let you know if the company has them or if they don't have them, uh, you, you may be able to, if you're comfortable, teach them about why diversity and inclusion is important to you uh, as an applicant for the company. Ask, um, ask the uh, human resource uh, representative if they have an employee resource group. These are groups that are, a specific to different communities. And if they have one for the LGBTQ plus community, you'll know that they're open to, uh, they're very open to the DNI. If applying to a small company, some, some of the small companies only may be one employee, your boss. Uh, if you feel comfortable when you apply for the job, ask them if they're, if diversity and inclusion are important to them. And then if, you, then if they don't, you could explain to them why it's important to you. Check, uh, check on, uh, for larger companies, corporations, uh, check on the human rights uh, committee, um, human rights uh, committee, campaign. campaign, I'm sorry, campaign, to see if the company's on their uh, corporate index, equality index. There you'll see a score from anywhere from 25 to 100. Uh, 100 being the best that they have all the policies in place that were able to give them that score. For high school jobs and intern applicants, you're, you're gonna be, uh, or even full-time applicants, you're gonna be at the job uh, for 20 to 40 hours of your life every week. And it's important that you, you enter a company that is open to diversity of inclu and inclusion. Apply to the company who values DNI. Bring your true self to the company every day you go to work. This will enable you to feel comfortable and, and valued by the company. And also remember, your skills are valuable. Your talent that you bring to the job every day is valuable. So you need to go to a, a company that's open to DNI and the LGBT community. Okay. And that brings us into pronouns in the workplace. Uh, gender pronouns are specifically referred to people that, that you are talking about. So uh, some of the, Pronouns are she, hers, and hers, um, he, him, and his. And then for the non-binary non group of people, they like to be referred to as they, them, and theirs. And it, it's important 
that people use the right pronouns that you want them to use. These are your pronouns. They're not preferred pronouns, they're your pronoun. So using the right pronouns show a sign of respect, that people respect you for who you are. It validates that they, uh, who they are, pronouns validate who you are as a person, and people should respect that. It's a very thing, it's a very easy thing for people to do, but people are, are not always accustomed to use um, pronouns for people who may, uh, may appear to be uh, female or maybe non-binary or, or male. Um, if, if, you're, uh, if you happen to, people think you're male and you want, prefer female pronouns, you need to explain to them that that's what you prefer. You uh, re prefer to be uh, she, hers, or hers. You can't, um, cannot always tell which pronouns to use uh, by someone's appearance. And that's very important. That's why you need to explain the pronouns you prefer to be used uh, for you. When becoming part of a new workplace, inform the people of your pronouns. Introduce yourself by using your pronouns. For example, hi, I'm Jennifer. I go by she, hers, and hers. Or, hi, I'm Jim. I go by he, him, and his. So th this is very important that you introduce it to these two new people that meet you right when you meet them for the first time. If the people use the wrong pronouns, it's not because they, it could be a mistake and it, it may, they may not have intended to disrespect you. So, you know, correct the person, explain to them the pronouns that you'd like to be used for you. And if they continue to use the wrong pronouns and you know it's on purpose, you know, talk to your supervisor, your human resource person within the company, and explain to them how important it is to be used, the right pronouns be used for you. And also, if you're in a company with emails, you'll have an email address, you uh, put your pronouns in, the, in your signature block, like I show as an example in the bottom corner. This way, it'll help introduce, it'll help introduce your pronouns to every person that you send an email to. Using incorrect pronouns purposely is a sign of disrespect. Like I said, people may, may do it by, by mistake and it may take a couple of times for you to correct them and then they'll be accustomed to it and they'll try to, try to use the correct pronouns for you. Too much important is, is put on just using the male or female pronouns. There's many, there's many different types of people in the world, non-binary, gender queer, that they, they don't use the standard pronouns or male or female. So people need to respect everybody and make them feel comfortable in the workplace. It, it's painful for people to, to be, for the incorrect pronouns to be used. And you're gonna be spending a lot of time at a job anywhere from, it could be from 10 to 40 hours a week, and you have to feel comfortable going into work every day. So try to be patient with people, but also if incorrect pronouns are continued to be used, talk to your supervisor or human resource uh, personnel. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Tom. That's a great segue for us to talk a little bit about microaggressions in the workplace. Microaggressions are brief or common daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental communications that whether intentionally or unintentionally transmit some kind of hostile, derogatory, or negative messaging to a target person because they're part of a stigmatized group. So we've all met rude people in our lives. How are rude people different um, than microaggressions? Microaggressions are really specific. They're very targeted. They're the kinds of remarks or questions that are painful specifically because that person is a member of the group that is discriminated against or are commonly subjected to stereotypes. So what are some common microaggressions that one might experience in the workplace? You might be subject to heterosexist or transphobic language. You might really hear an endorsement of heteronormative culture and behaviors. Um, and that's one that's really, really common in today's world. Uh, you might see some assumptions or stereotypical LGBTQ plus experiences, or in general, just discomfort or disapproval of the LGBTQ plus experience. 
Um, so similar to what Tom had said, if you find yourself coming into contact with people who are consistently applying microaggressions to you in the workplace, or you're unsure if it's a microaggression, it's really important for you to inform your supervisor or to talk to an HR leader about what you're experiencing and, and work through that problem with that team. So I think that's also a perfect segue to talk about being an ally because it, as an ally, if you see someone expressing a microaggression, you can step in as an ally and, and correct that person and educate that person. So what does it mean to be an ally? This is a lifelong process of building relationships based on trust, consistency, and accountability with marginalized individuals and or groups of people. And I personally love referring to the guide to allyship.com. It explains it beautifully. To be an ally is to one, take on the struggle as your own. Two, stand up even when you feel scared. So again, addressing those microaggressions when you hear them. Three, transfer the benefits of your privilege to those who lack it. And four, acknowledge that while you too may feel pain, the conversation is not always about you. So other key takeaways here. Often people in the LGBTQIA plus community are burdened with having to educate other people on this, along with many other topics. There are several resources out there to become informed, as well as attending virtual events like this one, uh, to stay engaged and to, and to learn more. And I think it's very important as allies to take on that responsibility to educate one another, to just take away that burden from people in the community and just to really prove our allyship to them and commitment to them, to being engaged, to being informed, and to also leverage our privilege to protect them and to protect one another. The next takeaway that I'd like to address is, we need to continue to create and build safe spaces around us, especially in the time we are in currently right now with everything going on in the news and in the media and on, on, uh, on our social networks, you know, it's very important for us to create those safe spaces for one another and hey, we are all in this together. How can I help you? And I think if we go on with that mindset, we can make more progress and really work together towards a better world. And what I would love to leave you with is a quote said by our very own Robin McHalen. You don't have to keep up but you have to keep open. And this is something she said to me when I was interviewing her for a community one-on-one -on -one with my work with the Obama Foundation. I was just interviewing her on <clears throat> how True Colors came about. And I really appreciated this statement, you know, with, with new identities coming about in the, in the community, as well as pronouns that we are constantly learning about. You know, there's a level of expectation where you know you don't have to keep up, but can you try to understand and can you please try to keep open? So I just love that. I say it all the time. And if Robin, if you're listening, thank you for teaching me that. And to learn more about being an ally, I'm sure True Colors has lots of resources, but another resource here is the guide to allyship.com, which is a project created by a powerful black queer femme, Amelie Lamont. And thank you for listening and keep being an ally. So finding an ally at work. There, I think as Tom mentioned earlier, you know, you might not know who is an ally at work. And we mentioned earlier ERG or an employee resource group. And an, at an employee resource group, you may be able to find allies there or someone at work who can create that safe space for you and thus you can create a safe space for another person as well. ERGs provide a resource for leadership regarding employee and community issues that are going on at work. This can, can provide a clear communication and dialogue with our leadership to really tune in to what's going on in the community. And that way we can get our CEO and leaders to really advocate for, for solutions that can help address those issues in the workplace. Being part of an ERG also builds a supportive and respectful and most important, inclusive culture for everyone. And, you know, I think also being part of an ERG, everyone can be an ally. And this is something that we emphasize, you know, you don't have to be a woman to be part of a women's network, or you don't have to identify in the, in the LGBT community, you know, but you can be an ally and still be part of the community and advocate for one another. So that's something we're all, always trying to push as a key takeaway and message. 
here pictured, this is the Stanley Black and Decker Pride and Allies Network. So this is us at our at the Pride Parade in Hartford last year. It was so much fun. And this is something I look forward to every year. And one thing I'm really proud of as well is we have an LGBTQIA plus 101 training program where we educate employees and managers and leaders who really want to learn more and become more culturally competent in, in regards to learning about the commu community as well as how to become a better ally at work. So thank you all and you know, thank you for, for listening to me today and I hope that you enjoy what we presented today. Okay, and then to, to wrap up our discussion here, I'm just gonna cover dealing with the lack of understanding in the workplace. And this is really just, if anything, um, a little bit of a summation of what we discussed, as well as things that you should keep in mind as, as someone who is a part of the Pride community yourself, if you are. Uh, the first thing that I would suggest doing, if you're new to a company and, and you're part of the Pride community and you, you wanna figure out how to find your people, I would suggest finding an ERG to join. That was the first thing that I did. Um, if you don't have an ERG at the company that you just started working at, you can go ahead and try to start one yourself. It's always a good idea to do. You could also try to find, if, if there isn't an ERG or if you don't feel comfortable joining an ERG and, and outing yourself in that way, uh, you can also try to find a support group within your workplace, whether that's just from one, uh, one coworker or a group of people who are either part of the community themselves or who you now are allies. And, whoops, sorry. Um, you can use those people, whether they're, again, whether they're part of the community or their allies, you can use also their, you know, their, the, the number of people that you have banded together. Uh, you can, as a group, educate others. Or if you feel comfortable, you can educate others yourself. The other thing that I would suggest doing is scheduling a meeting with HR. If you, uh, this is especially helpful if you've dealt with um, microaggression or some type of discrimination in the workplace, I would definitely suggest reaching out to HR. The first thing that I would discuss with them is your experience in the workplace. What did you deal with, whether it was a microaggression or any type of discrimination? Definitely make that known with the HR person you're meeting with. Explain how that experience affected you in the workplace and whether People know it or not, microaggressions on a large scale, if you hear it over and over again, they start to affect you. Whether you're at home, in the workplace, in the community, they affect you. So it's important to, it's important to vocalize how that microaggression or how that type of discrimination affects you, because it does. Ask uh, HR where either you can offer support or where they can offer support to you or to people from the community. You can ask them if they could provide training to the employees. You can ask them if you could start an ERG to help spread awareness. You can ask them if you can pass out pride flags within the workplace or even raise a pride flag on your workplace's campus if that's an option as well. And if it isn't, definitely keep pushing because they'll nudge eventually. Um, the, the final thing that I just wanted to mention is, this is something I've been thinking about all day today, you have power. You have your own power to either come out in the workplace or not. If you feel comfortable doing that, if you feel safe and comfortable talking about your own experiences with people, saying, oh, my partner, she, or, or what have you, if you feel comfortable doing that, do it. Um, and that's your control. That's your power. If someone takes that away from you, if someone in the workplace outs you, definitely go speak to HR about that because that's not okay in the slightest. Thank you. All right, so we're diving into some personal stories here. Um, and I think I'm the first one up. So um, just wanna share a little brief story about an experience I had pretty early on in my career um, that included some really traditional and stereotypical diversity training in a, in a classroom environment. Um, and so just really, really quickly through it, it's quite a long story, but um, you know, through the video that the group was watching and the facilitator, um, we were going through groups of uh, people who were discriminated against commonly. And there was discussion that was facilitated around each one of the groups, what went wrong in the scenario, what didn't go wrong, how to handle it correctly and so on and so forth. So I'm sitting there as a relatively young individual, um, the only person who was openly out in the environment, one of the only females in the environment. 
Um, and I'm, I'm waiting because I know that the LGBTQ example is definitely going to come up. And so as expected, that example comes up. And um, unfortunately, after the example was shared, when some of the facilitation on the feedback happened, there was some really um, what would be considered microaggressions that were shared with our HR manager who verbalized to the group as well as another fellow employee at that time. Um, and, you know, at the time in, for my life, I, you know, had always been out at work and never really had a question of whether I would be or not. Um, but it definitely did not make me feel very comfortable. I felt very isolated. Um, and at the, that point in time, my supervisor kind of leaned over to me and he said, you know, you don't hear this stuff outside of this room, right? No one talks to you like this around here. And I kind of gave him a look like, if you think that people are like bold enough to make these comments in an HR training, um, you know, it's safe to assume that, you know, there's other commentary that happens in the work environment. And um, I look back on that situation a couple of different ways. I think one of the main takeaways is, you know, we always think that HR is a safe space. And unfortunately, in some environments, HR themselves also need to be trained on certain issues and how to handle certain issues. So, you know, we talked about it in earlier slides. Oftentimes, folks who are members of a marginalized community uh, take on that burden of education. And you might find yourself in one of those situations where you might have to be the one to educate people. Um, and that's always going to be your choice. Uh, in that event, I made it my decision not to educate that individual because. I had no interest in interacting with them and I felt comfortable with who I was and I, I kind of moved on from the situation. The other thing that it made me really think about was, you know, thankfully I had my supervisor there who was an ally and I knew him to be an ally, um, but I also kind of thought back on it you know, in reflective time is what, how would I have felt if he wasn't in that room? Um, to kind of back me up and to make my feelings feel validated and to justify, you know, the commentary that was heard as inappropriate. So, you know, it made me think a little bit differently um, around how would I plan if there wasn't an ally in the room? How would I, how would I support, um, you know, myself and how comfortable would I feel? And what it's really led to for me is just in general, um, being my own ally, being my own advocate and making sure that I'm educated and I feel comfortable in the situations that I put myself in that even if somebody isn't in the room who can kind of stand up and say the right thing, I feel comfortable doing so now. And that's not always easy early on in your career, but it's something that comes thankfully with some age and some wisdom. Thank you, Elise. Um, so I'll just I'll just share my personal story as well. Um, this is previous to when I started working at Stanley, thankfully. Um, I was in a retail setting. I was at the front desk uh, selling merchandise and uh, two people came up and they put things on the, the counter to purchase and then they realized that they knew each other and they started talking. Um, and the conversation, I wasn't a part of it. I was just trying to do my job behind the desk. Uh, but they were right there at the desk uh, having this open dialogue with one another. Uh, the conversation morphed into, um, you know, oh, it seems like all of the young kids these days are coming out as gay or trans or, or bi or what have you. And, um, and it just makes you question things. And, and I just found it incredibly disrespectful as, as someone who was a part of the community myself. I was extremely insulted um, because gays and trans people have not been around, you know, it's, it's, they've been around since forever. It's just that the awareness has become more apparent now and, and there's more discussion about it. And people feel more safe to be out now. So I, I think that that notion that this is a new thing is, is just ludicrous. Um, at the time, though, I didn't, because of the position I was in, because I was working retail, I didn't, and there wasn't really much of a support system within the workplace. It, it was a very small nonprofit organization. Um, I didn't feel comfortable speaking up. I, I thought that if I spoke up, I might lose my job, uh, which even still today sits with me. You know, it, it's something I carry. It, it's something that my, my choice to not speak up is something that I still feel shame about. Um, even though it was three or four years ago, um, you know, so, so I guess with, with that in mind, there are two key takeaways that I would say, uh, one of which I didn't put down here, but I'm just realizing now. The, the first is, as you can see here, if you don't have, if, if you don't feel that you have the power to speak up and you're worried about being fired for speaking up, 
that company does not deserve to have you there. Um, they, they don't, you're, you're just better than that. You, you deserve better than that. Um, and that's something that I realized uh, more and more as I kept working there. I realized that I deserved better than, than the environment that I was working in. Um, and then the other thing that, that, you know, something that's also important to, to think about as well, um, it, at the time, I didn't feel comfortable speaking up. And usually I am that type of person to speak up, but within, I think within the workplace environment, at least at the time in my life where I was, I didn't feel comfortable doing that. But as I mentioned, even still four years later, I still feel shame about not speaking up. Um, because if I, if I had spoken up, maybe I would have been able to change those people's minds. So the, another key takeaway that I would say is if you're a part of the community or if you're an ally, think of, you know, I, I would suggest to mentally prepare yourself for a situation wherein it's important for you to speak up. Um, you know, think about, okay, th let's just say something like this happens. What will I, what would I do in that situation? It's important to kind of walk yourself through that process because for me, Previous to that point, I had only spoken up within a, a family context or within um, like a, a school con context or within a being with friends within that type of context. So I felt safe to speak up. I felt safe to be able to speak my opinion within the workplace at that time. I, I just didn't feel safe doing that. But I think I had I would have felt more safe if I had prepared myself for that type of situation. So that's something else that I would just suggest considering. That's another key takeaway that I would um, that I would recommend you think about, uh, you know, again, either as an ally or someone who is a part of that community, just kind of try to prepare yourself. Because I can say I, I'm not happy about what I did. And I, I wish I didn't carry that shame. Um, you know, I wish I could turn back time and speak up. So, so just think about that, you know, do you want to carry that shame? If potentially, if you feel that, um, or would you rather speak up? Just something to think about. Right. Adding my story. Um, so I, uh, last year we had a, a call for allies, uh, to speak at an event and really share their story and around why it's important to be an ally. And, uh, I, I really didn't know that I necessarily had a story to share, but I felt that it was an opportunity for me to, um, you know, be a, a visible ally into, uh, support the, the community at my company. So I volunteered to, to speak a little bit about uh, my own experiences and why it's so important uh, in, in my life to, to be an ally to the community. Um, it's very important to me. It's very important to my family. And uh, after I had spoken at this event, someone I, I didn't know in the company uh, had uh, approached me and told me how meaningful it was to hear me speak about being an ally. And it really showed me um, how much power that you do have as an ally and that uh, how much it really can be supportive and how much you can really do meeting that call of, of supporting this community. Um, so there really is so much that you can do as an ally and, and it even takes little things to help support the community and it really goes a long way. So there's, there's, there's really a lot that you can do as an ally and there's so much power to it. And I'm just so grateful to be able to be a part of that community at my company and really support that and really make sure that everyone really has a, a, a safe environment um, and that I'm, I'm part of providing that. Tom, I think you're on mute. Yeah, that was a lesson I should have learned a long time ago. Uh, take yourself off mute. <laughs> I find it's important as an ally to be out and present. Uh, because I became a co-lead with Sophie of Pride and Allies Connecticut chapter. And there's a lot of people that I work with, probably it was the last thing that they expected from me. But I feel comfortable being out and being an ally to the LGBT community because I could, I could um, um, I'm trying to think of the word. <laughs> I could uh, steer people more towards it's okay to be an ally. It's okay to come out as an ally and support the LGBT community. It, it's very important to also teach people so the people within the community don't have to take on that burden. And I feel very comfortable doing that. Also, I've met, I've met some tremendous people uh, being an ally. Uh, people in the LGBT community that I would never have met. And uh, uh, maybe someday I'll meet you. But it, it's very important to be out there making sure that people are open to diversity and inclusion. And um, 
welcome people into the company and make them feel at home. Because like I said earlier on uh, talking about companies, you're going to spend a lot of time at these companies once you do get a job. And you have to be able to feel comfortable going in every day and not feel the stress of hiding. So being an ally is very important to me to uh, help people be comfortable within the workplace. All right, we've got some resources uh, for everyone. Uh, if you want some more information on anything that we covered today, uh, we do have a lot of resources and you can always uh, reach out to Sophie or Tom um, for any more information or if you need any help navigating any of these issues that we've talked about today. I also just wanted to, I, I wanted to put in my email address as well. Um, if you, if, you know, if there's a job that you're interested in applying to at Timmy Black and Decker, um, but you don't have a way in, you know, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to reach out, um, you know, and speak on your behalf. I would obviously need to meet with you a little bit to get to know you better to be able to do that, but I, I would be more than happy to, to do that. Um, the more people from the community we have in the workplace, the better. So, yeah, please reach out. Be proud and value yourself. <laughs> For sure. All right, with that, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.